Welcome back, everybody. That was incredibly inspiring. Next up, we have the President of the Republic of Kosovo, Vyosa Osmani, <laughs> who also has a big fan base in the crowd. She will also be speaking with investigative journalist Michael Isikoff, and she'll share some insights into how innovation and tech are joining forces in, and leading forces in the development of Kosovo. Get acquainted with her vision of the future for the country as she explores the transformative power of technology. Welcome, Vyosa. back. Um, it's not um, every day I get to interview two presidents in a row, um, so this is a true honor, um, Madam President. Um, Thank you. Uh, so um, let, this is a tech conference. There's a lot on the geopolitical stage which I want to talk to you about, um, but um, the title of our talk is The Role of Tech can play in a country such as yours. So tell us a little first about Kosovo, because you're a small country and um, a recent country, um, and the role that tech is playing in your economy. Uh, well, thank you so much. It's an honor to join you all in this amazing conference that is giving us so much positive energy from the very first time we entered the building. Uh, the Republic of Kosovo is the youngest country in Europe, not just in terms of the age of the, our republic, but also in terms of the age of our population. About two-thirds of our people are under 35, 53% are under 25, and practically we can say that Kosovo is a country of youth. And uh, a youth that is brilliant is absolutely tech-savvy, a youth that is breaking all borders, and it's making sure that it succeeds not just locally and regionally, but also becoming a global champion when it comes to tech development and is leading the way in that uh, respect. Uh, now, we do understand that we are a small country, but I'm a strong believer that the impact of a country is not determined by its sheer size and geography, but actually uh, by the resources uh, that it can offer to the rest of the world uh, through its ideas. Sometimes some of the biggest impacts actually come from the smallest countries. And we understand that we have a very important story to tell. And we believe that we have been given a mighty voice to tell it uh, by getting the help of nations, big and small, democracies around the world back in 1999 when they came to our rescue. And then in 2008 when we declared independence through the support of allies around the world. So right now, Kosovo is an example of developing democracy making sure that we are at the forefront in terms of reforms on rule of law, on economic growth, we're a champion in the region, uh, even though we've passed three very big crises like the rest of the world. And of course, we're also doing very well when it comes to civil liberties as well as human rights in general. So uh, we are leading the way in many fronts, but I would say the most important one is the way how our youth is leading the way and becoming a champion in the region and beyond when it comes how to tech so? development. Give, give, me, give us some examples sure. of so the, the role that I tech did, is playing. Yeah. Look, tech, generally speaking, has brought us a lot of opportunities. Um, opportunities that we never thought would come just you know, a decade or two ago. Uh, opportunities that have allowed us the kind of connectivity with the rest of the world that were never thought of before. So collaboration, cross-border cooperation is at an extent uh, that uh, was unprecedented. And of course, given that we have the youngest population in Europe, that in terms of tech skills is outstanding, in terms of uh, how multilingual they are, everyone in Kosovo speaks excellent language, but also German and a couple of other languages. The fact that the labor costs are the cheapest in Europe the fact that we're outstandingly flexible, the fact that geographically speaking, we are at a location that connects the East with the West, 
but also the time zones are allowing that kind of flexibility to offer the resources and the labor market for tech development has allowed us to become the tech hub that we are today. And according to the world's world reports, Kosovo has the highest, um, not just tech advantages, but also competitiveness in the entire southeastern Europe. So we, uh, of course, through cooperation mostly with countries like Germany and Switzerland, mm -hmm. but also the United States and the United Kingdom have managed to achieve the successes that we have so far. But I think there's still a lot of potential. And given everything that I've mentioned, I hope many of you here today will consider Kosovo as your great next destination to invest and collaborate with businesses who are here and doing an outstanding job representing the Republic of Kosovo. You have reminded us that you are the youngest country in Europe. Of course, your uh, independence grew out of the last war in Europe, um, the Kosovo War. Um, yet your neighbor, Serbia, has still not fully accepted Kosovo independence. Um, and in fact, there was a recent incident with uh, assailants crossing into your territory, killing a Kosovo police officer. Where do things stand with Serbia right now? Um, and is there a path through which they will fully accept Kosovo as an independent country? Um, Serbia will come to terms with this reality because Kosovo's independence and sovereignty is an irreversible reality a reality that was built with an outstanding sacrifice of the people of Kosovo and then with an outstanding support of the international community. Our independence was also um, in line with international law in accordance with the International uh, Court of Justice opinion of 2010 and the vast majority of countries around the world, uh, including Portugal, uh, where we're today, have recognized the independence of Kosovo. No one has lost anything by recognizing Kosovo. Quite the opposite, everyone has gained a friend and a committed partner, one with which they share common values and one on which they can actually count on defending these values when we face common challenges, uh, like the wars that we are facing today, whether in the continent of Europe or elsewhere outside of Europe. So Kosovo is a testament to what democracies can achieve when they actually stand together in defense of values such as freedom and democracy. Now, when will Serbia make that decision? It's actually up to them, and I would say the sooner they do, the better for the future of that country towards Euro-Atlantic uh, institutions and the better for long-term peace and stability for the entire region. The fact that the current leadership of Serbia still have Milosevic uh, in their minds and their hearts and are still led by the mindset of the 90s and want to take back the entire region back to the 90s is disastrous, and this is a logic and a mindset that we reject with all of our minds. Uh, what happened on the 24th of September actually was not just an incident, it was an act of aggression that Serbia organized, financed, they also trained the people who actually uh, uh, organized that insurgency paramilitary attack against Kosovo, um, and they are also hiding those terrorists right now within the territory of Serbia. This shows that this was, as it was also rightly called by the White House, a plan to destabilize the entire Western Balkans. Now, in whose interest that is, mostly? It's in the interest of Russia, because they want to open a new front against the West. Because the more conflict is spread, the less focal attention there would be on Ukraine, the less help there would be there, because the help, the support of the Western partners and the Western allies would be spread around all of these different conflicts. So Serbia, as a Russian proxy, actually is serving that intention, which is directed at attacking the values-based systems that the European Union and NATO represents. Do you have reason to think Russia was behind the Serbian incursion into your territory in October? We have every reason to believe, given Russia's support for Serbia politically, economically, and militarily that they are very much in favor and have supported uh, this uh, kind of attack. I mean, if you look at their propaganda, and this is where tech comes in, if you look at the kind of propaganda machine 
that Russia spreads mostly online, you can see months before an attack against Kosovo happens or months before an attack against Bosnia and Herzegovina happens, that it starts spreading among Russian channels. So they kind of push Serbia into that direction. And, and what, is, what is their messaging at this point, that you're really not a independent country, that you don't deserve uh, to be separate from Serbia? What, what is the Russian messaging about Kosovo independence right now? What Russia wants to do, and actually they say it very transparently in every interview of either Putin or Lavrov, they say, I quote, we're going to convince the rest of the world that America failed in the Western Balkans. So more than attacking us, they want to kind of showcase that the United States and the European Union are failing in their policy towards defending freedom and democracy, and we should not let them have it. And we will absolutely not let them have it. It's extremely important that the same way that we defended these values in 1999, we show that same unity right now because a lot is at stake, not just, you know, the freedom and democracy and the territorial integrity of Kosovo. And look, you know, we are a nation that endured centuries of occupation and invasion. We never lost our language, we never lost our ident identity, and most importantly, we never lost the resilience to struggle for our freedom and independence. And of course, we're not going to give up now. Given. Given the stakes, how important is it for Kosovo and democracies in Europe that Ukraine prevail against Russia? It's fundamental. I would say it's fundamental for the rest of the world because we're talking about basic rules of defending freedom and defending democracy and whether we're going to set the stage for what's coming in the next couple of decades or not. For that reason, we've supported Ukraine from day one. Uh, we adapted sanctions, adopted sanctions against Russia on day one. And we've been making sure that we uh, adopt new sanctions as they come in, either from the European Union uh, or the United States. Now, I believe that the Ukrainian people will absolutely prevail because there's nothing that can stand on the way of a people that is ready to give up anything for its freedom. So I'm absolutely certain that they will prevail. We just need to have the patience that it's necessary and it's crucial at this point in time because Russia, of course, is counting that people and countries will get tired and give up. What, what, what does that mean? That mean giving up now so that we can fight another war in a couple of years and then another one in 10 years and then another one in a couple of decades. So practically means opening up the way for dictators and giving them the message of appeasement, which in fact never works as okay, history shows. Given, given the fatigue that has started to set in in many quarters in the West, um, largely because the Ukrainians have failed to make the kinds of gains in their counteroffensive that many had hoped. Um, what is the strategy to dislodge the Russians from Donbas uh, and, and Luhansk and Crimea right now? A lot of people don't see a clear strategy that is going to achieve that result that you say is so essential for the future of democracy. I, having been victims of genocide ourselves, and having seen firsthand how crucial it is for democracies and freedom to prevail in one country for the sake of you know, the entire continent and beyond, I would say it's important that the strategy is long term. So the question rather is, what's the alternative? The alter alternative, the other alternative, if we allow fatigue to prevail, is giving up and making sure that there are more wars, whether we're talking about the eastern flank or we're talking about the Western Balkans or we're talking about other countries through which Russia has clearly showcased its imperialistic intentions. They are, as I said, very transparent about what they want to achieve. They don't hide it any longer. And it should be clear to each and every one of us that if we do not succeed here, 
The alternative is more wars in the next couple of years and the next couple of decades. And then that, I guess, gives us, you know, a shot of macchiato and some more, um, you know, espressos in terms of the energy that we need to move on and not allow fatigue to prevail. Secondly, the strategy is help Ukraine more. That's the strategy. If they haven't been able to advance as much as it was ex mm -hmm. expected with the help given so far, I think more help can help them achieve more advancement for all of us, not just for themselves. Speaking of wars, there's another one going on in the world right now, um, and that is, of course, the war between Israel and um, the Palestinian uh, Hamas in Gaza. You are the president of a country that is 90 percent Muslim. Um, last year, I believe, or last couple of years, you recognized the state of Israel, something not a lot of Muslim countries have done. Um, as you have watched events unfold over the last month, give us your thoughts and how it's impacting the people of Kosovo. Um, we have recognized Israel and Israel has recognized us back. So there was a mutual recognition process that took place about almost two years ago. Uh, but there's also a history that takes our people back. During the Second World War, among Albanians, among our nations, there was this code of honor that was called BESA. Based on this code of honor, every single family of ours made sure that they saved the lives of Jews during the Second World War, becoming one of the few, if not the only country in the world, well, the only place in the world where the number of Jews was higher after the Second World War than at the beginning of the Second World War. So there was this uh, very strong connection between our nations a long time ago. Israel came to our help during 1999 when we needed a helping hand, when 80% of our people were kicked out of houses, when we needed refuge, when we needed humanitarian support, and when we needed a voice because we were voiceless. And of course, for that, we are eternally grateful. Uh, for that reason, we have developed a good relationship, bilateral relations. Um, and of course, we were so very saddened with the 7th of, of, of October attack, which we have immediately condemned, uh, like the rest of the democratic world. Uh, now, of course, we are joining countries around the world, including the United States and the vast majority of the European Union in supporting the humanitarian pauses. Uh, because it's horrendous to see that much of human suffering among civilians in Gaza, uh, many of whom have nothing to do with, with uh, the terrorist attack uh, of the 7th of October. These civilians, the vast majority of which are children, need protection. They need humanity, uh, humanity to prevail. And among the people of Kosovo, everyone understands that kind of suffering. You know, so uh, you have I, not had demonstrations in Kosovo uh, on behalf of Hamas with people shouting? No, no, absolutely not on behalf of Hamas. No. Uh, no, there's no support for Hamas. However, of course, uh, like I believe every human being should, uh, everyone is very concerned with human suffering of innocent civilians, and I hope that the humanitarian pauses will advance to a humanitarian ceasefire, because in this way it will But if a humanitarian allow... ceasefire leaves Hamas in control of Gaza, is that an acceptable outcome? No, I, well, of course, we hope that the most important allies for democracy uh, that exist out there, who are giving all of their support, starting with the United States, moving on with many countries in the region which are actually trying to help to, to achieve that, as well as with members of the European Union, I hope that they will manage to find a solution that will not allow terrorists to prevail. What I'm talking about is making sure that there is a way to spare innocent lives. I'm talking about a way that everyone can, of course, which I believe would also be in Israel's interests, to make sure that future generations among Palestinians don't develop that kind of feeling of hate and contradiction 
because there needs to be space for peace in the future. As I said, we understand the situation extremely well, uh, and we understand the pain and the suffering of innocent civilians uh, because we have been uh, victims of the most horrendous crimes that humanity has known uh, in the past century. And we hope that as a small country, as I said, we can give any kind of contribution to help innocent civilians. Uh, and of course, uh, we will do everything in our power in, in that respect. Uh, while, as I said, we have supported Israel after the 7th of October attack, I, have, I hope that they, in cooperation and with the support of the United States, will find a way to help all civilians in Palestine because the suffering that the civilians have been ongoing, it's horrendous, it's outrageous, and all of us need to think about these innocent lives that are being lost. Well, I thank you, and I think everybody can agree with that sentiment. Thank you very much. Thank you.